Okay, I think I'll declare uh, with 15 people, we have a quorum. Um, and uh, so I will then uh, introduce our guest. Um, so I realized, uh, Nick, I can't even remember. I, you know, Nick, Nick, uh, Dr. Nick Hudson is the uh, group leader of uh, Robotics and Autonomous Systems. And I can't now remember where we met, but he's had a very distinguished career moving back and forth from the best corporations in robotics to mm. the best labs in robotics. He was at Boston Dynamics, I think. I met you at JPL, maybe. I don't know where I met you. Yeah, I we met you. We met at, um, yeah, definitely while I was at JPL. And I think it was the, Ma uh, sorry, maybe Mass, but also the Army RCTA. No, there was the, you guys were, yeah, dynamic small platforms. You've been, and you've stuff been like at that. Boston, you've been at JPL, you've been at, uh, haven't you, been, you, you did a stint? Yeah. Uh, um, at Google, you, yeah. At Google, right? Okay, so, I knew that you had. So, okay, so next. I don't know. Please. I was going to say one for better or for worse. I actually um, just took a job with Amazon Robotics with Sid Cernovasa too. So I've been at Cyro for three years. So I'm actually relocating back to the states um, from Brisbane. Um, oh, so I, I don't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I, I just, said, you've been oscillating back and forth yeah. between the very best uh, corporate settings and the very best uh, government laboratories. So, so, you know, uh, thanks to Abriana stewart Height for um, uh, making this connection to CSIRO. Our old, our, many of us have uh, long been friends of, of folks there. And, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll still talk to you even if you leave uh, CSIRO, Nick. But, uh, yeah, well, it's not a place I'm leaving, uh, leaving easily. And um, Navinda is actually the new group leader uh, huh. next Friday. So, um, huh. all right. All right, I'm going to let you, Nick, introduce Navinda, who I've only recently met through. Uh, okay. <laughs> Abriana. Well, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe what I'll do is, so Navinda Kadeje has been the a team lead in dynamic platforms, um, you know, on legged systems, and he's obviously taking over the group lead role. And maybe what I'll do is I'll start with a bit of, I'll maybe share my screen and give you a bit of strategy and context for what that all means. And then I'll do, um, sort of 25 minutes on DARPA, and then Navinda is going to talk a little bit on legs specifically at the end. So that's the plan. Um, so I'm going to attempt to share my screen, uh, which should, oh, uh, yeah. Do you have yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, of course, so hopefully you can see, uh, sorry. For, so I will be, yeah. OK, so can you guys see that OK? Yes, it's now projecting. I'm going to mute myself, uh, Nick. OK, but please feel free to interrupt. Um, as I said, it's sort of a three part talk. This is just a, sort of a really brief introduction of where we're going. So as opposed to doing more historical work in the group, we've spent a lot of time this year, uh, myself, Navinda, and a few other people in the group, along with CSIRO and Data61 about where we want to go. Um, and I was going to focus on that, A, because we spent a lot of time on it, but B, it's also, you know, interesting to get feedback on it. And um, it's it's very easy places for us to engage going forward. So I think, you know, one thing that's really unique to CSIRO is it's a national lab, but unlike JPL, where you're getting, you know, congressional funding to do space exploration, for instance, the goal, right, is to better... Australia and, you know, make SMEs uh, more effective, um, solve national challenges. And, you know, we really get, you know, brownie points or whatever by making industry better here. And um, but we're still very much a research lab. And so we get, you know, our KPIs are all around publications and doing new science. And the idea obviously is to um, have that change how Australia works and and better the country. And um, we obviously believe in robotics uh, to do that as a group. Um, and so, you know, we were thinking, well, what is, you know, five years, seven years from now, what does the world look like and what challenges are we trying to address, right? And I think one thing um, going through Boston Dynamics, uh, you know, five years ago is, you know, that's a, an incredibly effective team. I would sort of venture to say it's probably the most, it's one of the largest, most dedicated teams to legged robots uh, around. And obviously you guys have uh, ghost robots and, you know, you've spun that company out very successfully. But something that's really, I don't know, interesting or concerning 
perhaps, is how replicatable some of that is, right? Um, so, you know, they've spent, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year while I was at Google on, on spots, basically. And, um, you know, and then you get, uh, I'm trying to think of the small, um, sorry, Navin knows this off the top of his head, the, the, the $10,000 version out of China that's actually quite effective um, within, a few, within a year. Yeah. And, you know, I think something that, that really struck a chord with me was there is really, I think there's an advantage to being a daft rope, to be to have an advantage of being in situ with the end user, right? And so I realized that legged systems are more generic, you know, solves a lot of problems. But if we're focusing on robots that can solve specific problems or there's a specific advantage to working with the customer, then we can use evolution and automated design to sort of keep that design and development in Australia, right? So Really, we're looking at what types of robots can we build in Australia? How can we make it effective? And how can we differentiate? And we're thinking through tools for evolution and automated design to do that. Um, sort of second area that we've been putting a lot of thought into is you know, bushfires, natural, uh, natural environments, and how do you do biological monitoring, biodiversity analysis? Because Australia is you know, obviously vast and it doesn't have a lot of population and we've had a lot of issues with bushfires. So even things like getting robots on the ground and understanding fire load or um, if, a, if a forest fire has come through, they actually have these remote teams that get helicoptered in. It's a pretty high risk job. How do you start replacing those kinds of people or, or, or augmenting them with robots? Um, this, the fourth one up here, this woven city, isn't something that we're doing, but if you guys haven't sort of looked through the Toyota Research um, woven city concept, you know, it's basically like, what does the next generation city look like in Japan, right? And there's a lot of ideas in that around keeping people in their homes for aging population, allowing people to live remotely. That, I'm, I'm not saying we're gonna make a woven city in Australia, but that concept of, of dealing with you know, helping the population and dealing with remoteness and um, connecting people and doing some of the automated things is something that um, we have in our in our in our sites. And then lastly, onboarding um, manufacturer and you know human robot teaming to make things more cost effective. And specifically, in the top right here, there's there's actually a lot of really cool buildings that get built in Australia. Um, but funnily enough. Even today, some of the facades or the complicated pieces get made in uh, overseas, and then they get shipped back, which has a large, you know, cost. Um, and what people are actually finding is there's some traction to using robotics in conjunction with people. So not a fully automated assembly line, but more of a assistive system that when you're building larger things or you're building things again in situ. Uh, with the end user, there's a lot of advantages and really looking at, you know, human robot collaboration to make that happen. And so that's kind of some of our goals of where we want to go. And then in the middle, we have, you know, sort of some of the science questions that we're looking at sort of as a more generic thing. And yes, there's a lot of learning in that um, for different political reasons, but it's really how do we make robots more adaptive and how do we how do we use all the data and all that kind of thing? Because um, but then we're we're sort of focusing on these five five areas where we're, we're trying to work very closely with SMEs in Australia to build systems. Um, we're trying to grow our mobile manipulation capability. So um, Navinda's had a long history of doing legged systems, um, but adding in the manipulation component for different forms of utility. Non-urban navigation is a big thing our group is doing and focusing on. Um, and then the two, so situational awareness, um, we actually have a really cool project where we're dragging gliders underwater, you know, with a bunch of cameras trying to map out the Great Barrier Reef and look at different um, crown of thorns uh, starfish that are attacking the reef and really getting very good monitoring of that environment. And so that I think is a very generic robotic capability. It's something that we're really trying to push. And then lastly, how do we scale that, right? How do we, um, how do we take one person and have them command or, or use 50 robots, right? Or 10 robots even, as opposed to having one operator and one glider is really where we're going. Um, 
So I have a bunch of other slides on this I can use as sort of backup, I guess, but um, I think I'll end there uh, and then sort of jump into the DARPA stuff. If, but you guys have any immediate questions, feel free. Um, so CJ, I apologize if, I, I don't know if you were at the competitor summit, but these are my competitor summit slides uh, from DARPA. Um, but I'll have a slightly different take on them. But really this is, uh, I assume you guys are all very familiar with the DARPA sub T challenge, but essentially um, what I'm gonna talk about is we did a cave deployment uh, recently. And, and what the challenge is, is having one operator command a fleet of robots underground and, um, and really getting these robots into very you know narrow spaces, complicated spaces, in communication denied areas. And there's obviously a lot of challenges from terrain to coordination that you have to overcome. Um, and we did that with our team, right? So we are sort of the prime contractor on this. You know, we worked on the ground robots. How do they traverse? How do we do communications, exploration? And we're partnering with Georgia Tech, um, who unfortunately couldn't come to Australia for this event in August. Um, and then uh, Emerson is a is a drone spin out from um, CSIRO that has been doing all the drone autonomy work. Um, so I'm going to start by showing you guys a video, and um, this is this is online. I can send you the link too if you're having issues hearing me or you want to hear the um, the text on this. But we went up north uh, with this fleet of robots in the back of a car. Um, and obviously we have a bunch of support staff to get them there, which is still a problem. Like the deployment cost is still very high. These aren't ready to go systems, but they're commanded by one operator in the cave. And DARPA runs the challenge by setting up a starting gate, you know, with reference frames that all objects, there's a bunch of hidden objects in the course that you're not aware of. And the robots have to go out and find them and then report where they are. And so, um, we have you know, allowed one supervisor. This is actually Brendan from QUT um, commanding the fleet. And what we found over time is we've really worked on making the coordination a lot, uh, a lot higher, right? So some of us actually quite in uh, inspired by the work that you know CJ and you guys did with how are these things coordinating. But what we found over time is we've moved closer and closer to a fully autonomous system where it's it's coordinated completely on its own. And um, and so that's really what you're seeing here is the, the drone launches off the back of the ground robots. It allows it to get through narrow spaces. Um, and then the ground robots can go traverse uh, higher cost areas once it's released its payload. And another big thing about this challenge is really exploiting the heterogeneity of the system. So obviously in this, the drone can just traverse a whole bunch of um, terrain very quickly, uh, but its perception system's just not as good as the ground robots. And as you can see that ground robot there, it has to go over some incredibly difficult terrain to succeed in this environment, but it can actually get into narrower spaces. It has a much higher chance of seeing objects. And so using the two robots in a coordinated way and using the ability for the drone to go scout and for the ground robots to to exploit uh, the environment after that was really the way we approached this environment. And obviously we have automatic detection on the robots and stuff like that, and they report the objects back. And just as an interesting side, we also did this in the urban um, environments and we used the drone in a very different way because the ground robots were very capable of, um, of traversal. And so that the utility of the drone wasn't as obvious, but we ended up using it to go through things like um, holes in the floor and shoots and stuff like that. So um, yeah, the point is this fleet of robots is going out, exploring around the cave, bringing back a map, reporting where the objects are. Um, yeah, and it was it was it was actually one of the most enjoyable field trips I've gone on. Um, you know, despite being stuck underground. Um, for extended durations of time. So um, I think, you know, some of the components of this system are maybe a little obvious, but you start with sensing. Uh, so we spent a lot of time very early on working on the sensing system and then the SLAM system. How do you do multi-agent SLAM? And I'd say that was one of the really big strengths of our group. Um, 
we've had a long history of doing LiDAR SLAM. Um, and that was really the cornerstone of our approach, which I'll get into. And then we're using cameras and other sensors to do object detection. And something we really had to work hard at, this challenge really pushed our mobility capabilities. Um, I think we were very much a sort of 2D navigation uh, group before this challenge. And this has really pushed us to think about how do you go over very complicated terrain where you can't see things, you know, you know, you've got a lot of um, unobserved areas uh, and, and very aggressive terrain. And then obviously you've got to share that over data links um, and how do you make decisions in that kind of environment? So that's, so I'm gonna go through very briefly, touch on these today. Um, uh, but I think before I sort of really get into it, again, success for us in this challenge looks like many things, you know, maybe we'll win. Uh, I don't think that's really the point. I think the point, like one of the, one of the, the most important things for us is to, to work with SMEs in Australia and a really cool outcome is this cap pack up here, um, this, this LiDAR camera integrated sensing system. You can actually buy from AutoMap, uh, which is an Australian company today. So we started producing these um, early on. We sort of made a decision right at the start of the program to focus on a modular perception system. And it's taken us, I guess, two years to get it to the point where someone else can build them and sell them. Um, and this is obviously inspired by Emerson. You can actually buy their entire drone and their hover map um, unit. And uh, you know they sell that as well. But this is this is something that people are starting to use in Australia. Um, and it's allowed us to try out a whole bunch of different vehicles, right? So we built a hexapod. Um, uh, for the challenge, we're still using Ghost Vision 60s. Uh, and then for the for the cave challenge, we actually just took the tracked, uh, these two tracked robots in the drone, um, just due to how robust they are. Um, we actually rolled these several times and they keep going. Um, and so there was just some logistics choices we made it for cave, but we've run these systems and we're planning on running legged, legged platforms in the, the final event coming up. Um, I think maybe just touching on the how SLAM works, it's fundamentally a LiDAR based uh, system. And so obviously it's, it's a spinning LiDAR, which has a lot of implications. We have a wonderful field of view from the spinning LiDAR, um, but you obviously have to deal with it spinning and where all those points are accumulating and you get a lot of data, right? And so we're, we're using a, a voxel approach where we're basically voxelizing um, and it's, it's quite a, there's a bit of sophistication behind it. There's, uh, you know, offset voxel grids at multiple resolutions, and you're basically looking at the higher order statistics like curvature, planarity, and sphericity to do matching of these frames um, of these voxel maps. And and what that looks like is there's a really interesting continuous time optimization of the of the pose of the lidar while it's spinning um, at, through a five second time window. And that's obviously getting corrected through you know some iterative process, and then it's creating a five this five second buffer of data, and that gets voxelized, uh, compressed, and shared between systems. And so we end up with a whole bunch of these frames uh, here um, shown on the right, which you can um, align. And the th that's sort of the core of the approach, right? Is you're just sharing these frames every five seconds. Um, we do some reduction if the robot's stationary and stuff like that, where there's very low you know, overlap, but fundamentally every five seconds you're getting a new frame and then you can rebuild this kind of thing on each robot. Um, so uh, I th we, we should have more details about some of the specifics, the tunings and stuff we did um, on this. Um, there's a, a journal paper we hopefully will get accepted um, through this uh, new field robotics journal shortly. Um, but it's, you know, just, we're really solving the pose graph, a pose graph problem, where what we're trying to do is we're getting all these frames from different robots, and then we're adding different edges. Um, we're really becoming confident in certain edges. And we've really started very early sharing these frames amongst robots, and everybody's solving a global pose graph optimization. So every robot in the fleet, including an end base station, 
has uh, has a global representation of all other agents, roughly where they've been and what they've seen, which is really the basis for uh, the autonomy systems that we built on top of it. Um, oh, sorry, I think I'll. Nick, so um, leave that topic. Do you, do you get yeah. demonstrable benefit from the distribution, or is 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 it a bug, or is it a feature that this information is distributed? Uh, it's. I guess it has some really interesting implications, right? And I think one of them is. You you have to accept that so so for instance there's certain cases where when the drone takes off from the back of the other robot it starts up and it doesn't actually know it may not have merged in so it may not have all the data from all the other robots right and so there's definitely cases where robots are acting with only partial information and it makes the system sort of complicated in a way where if you just tell the drone if the operator just says drone go here you you really it's very difficult to do because you don't know the drone's reference system. And obviously what we do is we sort of seed it from the platform that it's sitting on. And that's sort of an initial guess, but the, U the UAV sort of has to take off, gather more data to really allow its system to become confident in where it is. And so what we end up doing is sort of tricks like, we actually tell the vehicle it launched from where the drone should go because those two have a really good sort of frame of reference and so it's it's interesting right because a lot of the thinking sort of switched to you know how do you command things with partial knowledge and we haven't fully solved that right and we've we've generally solved it with what bugs have come up like the drone one um so yeah i don't know if that answered your question or not dan but it it, but the other advantage is that you can, you know, we, we've also had cases where we've really struggled with communications and it's enabled these robots to do things that you couldn't if you needed all the data back on the base station. Does that make sense? I, I unfortunately can't see you because I'm sharing my screen, but I'll assume that's good. <laughs> yes, um, yes, thank you. Keep going, Nick. Yeah, okay, sorry. So um, the... I, uh, this is something that, uh, so Jason Williams joined us. He was actually a radar tracking guy. Um, and we really looked, We were, the other thing we really focused on was trying to have the same frontiers between the ground, the, the UAVs and the ground robots. And um, and what that really meant to us is how do you do this in, in 3D, right? Like we want the ground robot to also identify, you know, holes in the ceiling, right? So the sort of, the approaches of looking at, you know, a 2D grid map and then looking at the uh, the edges of that um, space, sort of like I think it was really prominent in the magic competition and stuff like that, um, was something we were trying to, you know, go beyond and really come up with a consistent way of representing the boundary between known and unknown space in 3D. And we really looked into sort of this visibility argument, and it ended up being a lot of clustering and all of that. Um, and funnily enough, so this is what we've been running the whole time. Um, and it was a really clever, it's, it's, it's sort of worth reading the paper. There's actually like, I'd say that something that's interesting about it is there's this really cool visibility algorithm that underpins it um, that we found a lot of utility for in different, in different areas that we do research in. Um, but funnily enough, we've actually moved to a voxelization um, approach as opposed to this uh, for various reasons. Um, and so we're, we're, we're sort of shutting down this direct point cloud visibility and moving to more of a voxelized approach. And it had a lot to do with the amount of computation and overlap and, and sort of consistency of navigation. Like a, a big problem that we're having with this is it ended up being a bit decoupled from the navigation stack. Like they were just, here are your goals. Um, but we really wanted to do more analysis about like clustering based on traversability and other things like that. And it just became more effective to start looking at the, the voxel map as opposed to the point cloud. Um, but still, this is what we've been running for all the discussions in this talk. Um, I'll give you a video of what that looks like for the ground robot. Um, and so what you can see is this is the urban event 
and this robot's just going off and deciding where to go. You know, it's not particularly efficient. I think other teams did a better job of deciding which frontiers to drive to. Um, but you can see this robot is successfully driving around, exploring different rooms, um, looking at different clusters of these frontiers, and then you know making decisions about which ones to go to next. Um, and so we actually explored a, a lot of the space like that. Um, and, and I guess a good side effect was we, when we did this sort of motion of looking at all these smaller frontiers and, and a little bit of the backtracking, it actually did help us find objects. And for instance, like CMU, um, the in, uh, Endeavor team, they actually had a much straighter path, a much a path that sort of went through the environment in a much smoother way. But they actually had issues finding objects because of that. Um, they weren't exploring all the nooks and crannies enough. Um, but they were more uh, efficient at exploring space than we were. Um, oh, how do I go to the next slide? Sorry. Um, and then the drone. Uh, so this is the the same the same thing happening on the drone. The images are a little bit uh, different, um, but the same algorithms running. And so all those pink points are frontiers, and the drones choosing them and then going to them and we essentially had a different prioritization. We're trying to go things higher up that the ground robots couldn't go to, um, but the drone had a really good time um, exploring around and, and seeing different parts of the environment as well using the same algorithm, which was great. Um, and then I think something that uh, we actually just got published in uh, RHEL, uh, I think it was just accepted the other day, um, was you know, for this cave challenge in particular, we were really worried about you know negative obstacles and how do you navigate through things that you can't necessarily see everywhere. And you know, just to give you an idea uh, of what we're trying to do, is obviously as this robot approaches the edge of this big uh, mezzanine or um, platform, you know, this robot's extremely capable. It can actually drive down 60 degree surfaces. Uh, not that we let it. I think we cap it at 45 degree surfaces. And so you can actually drive off uh, very steep ramps, right? And in urban environments, there aren't too many 45 degree slopes. There are some in caves, but things like stairs and the ramps over here, right? You wanna be able to drive up to a staircase without knowing it's there semantically. So um, we, just, we started with what semantically detect staircases, decide to drive down them that way. And we had some visibility issues, right? So, you know, how do you know it's a staircase if it's going down was quite a difficult question. Um, but more generally, we wanted to make it work in caves and sort of non-human environments. And so what we want the system to do is drive up to an edge and that edge gets steeper and steeper and steeper, right? So, you know, as the sensor can observe more off the edge, you have this virtual surface or like the most optimistic, uh, surface that you can get, which is this orange color here, right? So what we're really doing is breaking the world up into virtual surfaces, which are our most optimistic estimate of the, of the slope beyond. And then, you know, the green is things we know we can drive over. And then purple uh, here, um, like you can see, this is the handrail. These purple elements here are things we know we can't drive over with any platform. And we spent a lot of time you know, building up uh, this uh, voxel map. Uh, it's actually open source. Um, it's the links in that paper. Um, so I believe, uh, like I know, and I believe this is all sort of open source stuff now. If you're interested, but really trying to focus on how do you model these unknown areas with these steep slopes, right? And where where the capabilities of the vehicle are approaching, you know, the 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 uh, fields of views of your sensors. So um, I'll show you a, a short video of that in the in the cave. Um, sorry, this. Um, and yeah, so this was this was one of the cave environments that we were in. Um, and we'll break into a video in a little bit, but what you can see is, okay, that, that's actually a very steep slope, it's going up. Um, 
And it's trying to go to this gray cylinder over there. And it's trying to figure out how to get there because a the human said go there, I believe. Or I think, sorry, I take it back. The ex exploration algorithm said go there in this case. It's actually not a great place to decide to go to. Um, and the robot's sort of trying to push its way up the steep slope. So you can see the, the robot on the top there, the big Titan tracked robot, getting up that very steep slope. Um, it's got some fatal costs around it. Uh, it's, it's aware of this uh, area it hasn't observed to its left, and it's sort of approaching that edge and then getting more data off it. Uh, admittedly, it should be more conservative than it is. Um, and what the robot did is it, um, as it kept approaching that surface, it decided to go back away. Um, this is another example where it actually crests over a really large berm in the middle of the ground. So it, it crests this berm decides the other side is traversable, and then drives down it successfully um, is an example of where it did approach an obstacle that it didn't couldn't see, and then it navigated down it um, successfully. Um, so, oh gosh. Um, so yeah, anyway, and so then one of the other big questions we kind of had especially for the cave, was how do we, we really started with this topological map. I think um, there were a few teams that really thought about like, okay, we started in tunnel environments. Really what matters is, you know, the connectivities of hallways and stuff like that, right? And as we moved into this cave environment, the big difficulty is the local navigation system has a much higher resolution, obviously. And how do you, convey that information to other robots in an effective way? And how do you sort of do global planning that adapts as you get more local information? And what we ended up doing was creating these, uh, basically using a subgraph approach where we have, um, we'd, we'd take our local cost map data uh, and then we would segment it using, I guess, a super pixel algorithm in this case, where we basically break it down into cells and we break it down based on, you know, attitude, uh, sorry, like um, orientation, um, you know, roughness or costing, and we just group it into cells. And then we create these subgraphs and then share these subgraphs between agents. And so it's, it's really trying to convey between agents, you know, what parts of this world are traversable or, or can you group them together? And it sort of allowed us to feed in the local navigation data into the global nav that's shared between agents effectively or somewhat effectively, I guess. Um, and this is what it looks like in practice. So this is a simulated world from DARPA where uh, basically you have a known space with the gray here. You have um, uh, observed traversable stuff with black and fatal, which is white. And then we're running a super pixel algorithm over it and then you end up sharing these graphs between agents and then each of the nodes, uh, that's sort of the, uh, the nodes in the graph, um, vertices in the graph have their sort of, this is what this cell looks like. And then that allows different agents to decide if they wanna go there or not. Uh, we're still struggling a little bit with how do you do it for different vehicle types? Um, you know, So we have vastly different capa vehicles with vastly different capabilities. How do you share that effectively is an open question for us. Um, but we've essentially just said, we've, we've made it as uh, optimistic as possible. So we share things in a very optimistic way if we believe it's diversible or not between agents. Um, and then ultimately, right, so we've, what we, what we have been doing is sharing these maps between agents, like uh, the global, like solving a global slam solution. And then on top of that, each of these frames that we talked about earlier, we're, we're basically attaching these graphs, these uh, traversability graphs. And what we're also doing is attaching all the objects uh, that we find in that and, and different you know, goals. Um, so when we say we wanna go to location X, Y, Z, we don't do it in the DARPA reference frame. We say, I wanna go to a point relative to this slam frame. And in this map here, um, you know, there's only two slam frames in this map. There's this, uh, sorry, we also cluster all the slam frames to sort of make them more efficient. Um, so these are what you call root nodes of slam frames. But these two white points are, are basically 
slam frames that we're attaching data to and sharing. And then we have like one map out here and another map out here, the agent. And then these purple bowls are frontiers that this agent wants to go to. And it actually shares that with all the other agents. Um, and so this is the representation that we're trying to do autonomy on and, and make decisions on. Um, and, oh, sorry, hopefully this plays. So, and this, this basically shows a video of um, two agents doing task allocation. So what's happening here is uh, the robots, um, the robots had an initial, oh, I'll play this again because it, it, it takes a couple goes, but the large robot is the only robot that can drop communications nodes. And the small robot is a bit faster um, and it obviously can't drop communications nodes, but it's very effective at exploring. And so initially in this video, what occurred, um, oh gosh, it's not letting me, what is that? Uh, initially in this video, the large robot um, was going to the right over here. Um, and then, oh, sorry guys. Um, and then they switch to so the, the large robot and going to the left where we ask somebody to drop a comms node. And so we're doing that through a task allocation framework um, where we basically have um, different tasks that we send out. So what we say is, as opposed to saying robot A, drop a comms node here, we say, we need a comms node here. And then that gets auctioned out. Um, that task then gets bid on by different robots. And not all robots may be aware of all tasks, that's okay. So it's, it's not gonna be completely optimal, but what we can do is at least coordinate between robots that are in a similar area. And generally those robots will be in communication and so they can make local decisions. And we're sort of saved by the fact that tasks which are very distant are probably very inefficient for that robot to go to anyway. And so even if there's local information, we still end up with reasonable choices in many cases. Obviously we have examples of this failing horribly as well. Um, but you know, we're really trying to work on, like the thing we're really trying to work on now is how do we use the human to kind of inform these tasks? Like we think a comms node should be here and have the robots be as autonomous as possible to be able to guide them. Um, and yeah, that's, I guess the end of, uh, end of this talk. And yeah, I really do hope one way or another we see you guys this year. Uh, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> in person, I think that would be, a really good outcome. Um, and then this is just videos of our teams, uh, different robots that we deployed. So this one here has a, a ghost, was one of the first robots we actually deployed. And then in this challenge, we got our bigger Titan robots and our uh, Hexapod. And then for the cave, uh, for the urban event, we just ended up running track platforms um, in part due to some logistics issues, honestly. Uh, it's very hard to get over the States, but also because it, they work very well in the urban environments. Um, and then, you know, the traditional robots falling over and smashing themselves pictures. Um, so yeah, I'll um, maybe stop sharing my screen. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, you can see all my horrible. Um, Um, so I don't know, do you guys have any questions quickly or did Navin, did you want to talk a bit and then we'll take questions? Uh, if there are any questions for Nick's part of it, uh, you guys can ask, I'll start sharing my screen in the meantime. I guess I'll just take the opportunity to ask one quick question. So first off, fantastic job. I mean, CSIRO has always been one of my favorite teams in sub -tier. You guys are, you guys are really good. Uh, Thanks. I had a question about, um, you know, coordination and uh, communication in this kind of and obviously one of the big issues is um, uh, dealing with the paucity of communication that you find in this kind of kind of uh, yep. uh, environment. I was just wondering if you want to comment quickly on uh, how that plays out for you. Yeah, so uh, we're not going to lie. That's been one of the biggest challenges for us. And we started the challenge trying to make our own communications nodes. And then when we talked with you guys and the ghost guys, we ended up using Regents, which is what we still do today, right? And so we use them as our physical layer and for all the meshing and we actually just had a call with Regent yesterday because um, it's not completely solved still for us. Like, um, and, but what we ended up doing, and 
you know, this was very much inspired by what the, the paper you guys published um, around sort of having manifests and sharing that way. So we sort of unashamedly took a lot of inspiration from you guys on that. And so we, we have this system called Mule where he really, each robot has a manifest of each of the frames and each of the objects connected to those frames, right? And then that can be shared sort of periodically in a discovery type way. And then robots are basically using sort of a Batman-like thing where it's like, oh, I seem to have good connectivity to this robot. Uh, let's dump data between these two opportunistically, I guess. And then um, something we've been working on more recently, which is definitely, I know something that you guys were very like way ahead of everybody else was having robots ferry data back if the communication chain is broken. So what happens is robots will accumulate a certain amount of new information. And then at some point they just go, it's not getting back to base. I'm just gonna drive back, right? And what we do is we start a task, which is like return data. And, um, and then we auction that off and someone drives back with all the data basically. And um, it's still a massive work in progress, CJ. It's just really hard. I don't know, <laughs> but that's, so we, we really started with this persistent communication idea of let's drop lots of little nodes everywhere. And then we progressed to more and more of dropping fewer and fewer nodes and having the robots be more autonomous, but we still use that commons backbone uh, sort of in quite an effective way um, or we try to anyway, if that makes sense. Great, thanks so much, Nick. Yeah. I have a bit of a left field question. Sure. You put one of my favorite words on your first slide, which is affordances. Um, but yeah. You said that you were going to have the robots learn the affordances or have some kind of learning system determine what they are. So I'd, I was mm -hmm. wondering how you guys are thinking about this concept about what affordances are and their relationship to actions. It seemed like you had this dichotomy. Yeah. Nice. So so I'm not going to lie. Purpose stack as as fielded has almost no machine learning in deep learning of course types, right? The course is implicit in what you're doing, but you can decide you can traverse this, you can't I think, right? but um, we're basically I, looking I don't know at if you're breaking up for anybody else, but you're kind of breaking up for me. Oh sorry. Um I'll be happy to answer this offline too if if you're oh no. Um oh, you're, you're back now. Now you're better. Now you're better you're back now. Yeah. Better again. Okay, well, I guess what I was saying is, I think it's implicit in everything. If you think about, if you like thinking about affordances, you can think about them in many ways, right? But concretely, one of the real difficult things that we've had is, can you fit this robot through this tight space? Mm -hmm. um, and it's really difficult, right? Because door frames, sure, but think about caves and caverns and stuff, right? And so... We actually have this behavior. Um, so Brendan Tidd, that operator, he's he's actually made a, a door behavior, which is he looks at where we want to go and where we are and the cost map and the sort of 3D cost map. And then it's, can this, afford, can this sort of behavior, this push behavior make it through? And it's sort of like a binary classifier, like will this push behavior work? And what happens is as our system digresses, right? Like as our planners all fail, which they will, <laughs> We basically go, does this behavior, can this behavior work? Mm -hmm. And it says yes more often than it should at this point, but then basically it just slams it through the doorway <laughs> or the, the cavern, right? And so it's very much a work in progress. Um, but I think even in DARPA, we're thinking about starting to think about things that way. Um, if that, does that make sense? It does, and that makes me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> because a, a lot of the time, um, when I talk to roboticists about these concepts, they're they're thinking about how can I represent the affordance inside the robot using something that the um, that the roboticist then won't necessarily be able to understand through some complex deep learning process. And this is a much mm. more like there's a behavior that I want to do. It is specific to this robot and to this environment combined, and we're going to figure out whether whether we can do that. That makes perfect yeah. sense to me. Yeah. So thank you. Well, that's good. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it means it will work. <laughs> I hope um, so too. Maybe I'll go on mute. Uh, Nivin, did you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, and Nick covered a lot of technical ground. So uh, I'll probably just 
try to show pretty pictures and videos. Uh, uh, maybe just um, just before I start, I'll try to give a very quick introduction about myself. Uh, unlike Nick, I haven't been that adventurous in traveling around. Uh, this is my um, 12th year at CSIRO. So I joined as a postdoc many years ago and uh, be, been doing various things, uh, but mainly legged robot research. So uh, the work that I'll kind of show in these slides um, kind of span that period. So uh, we do mainly, uh, we've been doing mainly six-legged robots uh, for various reasons, because they, they, they have uh, static stability. They don't tend to fall over as much as uh, four-legged robots, and we can build them quite small. And uh, we like giving names to our robots. So each of these have names. Some of these are legacy robots. They're not operational anymore. Uh, but yeah, uh, we have Gizmo, which is a 18 degrees of freedom hexapod that can, uh, once folded up, can fit fit on your palm. It's quite small. And then we have Z, again, uh, um, 18 degrees of freedom hexapod. Uh, Viva and Bullet have five degrees of freedom per leg, which means they've got a total of 30 joints. Uh, and then we've got Amazon bot, uh, so named because we actually did get to deploy it in the Amazon rainforest, which was pretty cool uh, as part of a biodiversity monitoring project. And then uh, we have Max. Uh, the scale might not be obvious, but this is uh, this is about two meters tall, so it's 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 a fairly large uh, robot. So this was uh, the brainchild of our late um, Alberto Elfes. So he was very much keen on doing um, what we refer to as ultralight uh, robotics, where even though the robot is quite large in size, uh, the weight was less than 60 kilograms for this robot. Uh, with that came a lot of control challenges, a lot of interesting control challenges, some of which we got to address partially, but it's, it's a hard problem. Uh, and then we do have a four-legged robot, but not your typical quadruped. So this is Magneto. It's got um, uh, electromagnets for its feet. Uh, so it can adhere itself to ferromagnetic surfaces, uh, walk, uh, walk on uh, walls and ceilings uh, for inspection tasks. And th there are some videos in the next slide, which hopefully would play. And then uh, our most recent hexapod uh, was Bruce. That's the one that we built for the DARPA sub T challenge. Uh, hopefully you'll see some of these videos playing and I'll try to explain some of these things. Um, so on the, on the top left, you'll see some work that we did uh, with our 30 degree of freedom uh, robot to try and see uh, what are the efficient uh, limb configurations for, for locomotion. So this particular robot can have a more mammalian style configuration, as you see in the video. Uh, it's a bit strange to see a six-legged mammalian configuration, but uh, uh, it can do that. And it can have a more insectoid stance for more rougher terrain as well. And uh, then in, in the middle, uh, top middle, you see um, uh, Z. Uh, this was um, manually operated, where we tried to use its limbs to manipulate the environment, so lift a rock. Uh, that was a number of years ago. And recently, what we try to do is do the same uh, more autonomously. So that's what you see on the top right hand side. So that's Weaver. Uh, um, 30 degree of freedom export. It's it's using a Intel real sense to get a uh, uh, get some information about the environment. Once it detects an obstacle, it uh, automatically de uh, de um, tries to move move it away. If we have time, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. And then uh, bottom left hand side, you see Max in action. That probably gives you some sense of scale about how big this is, but also the control challenges because you'll see it swaying as it moves. Uh, and then you'll see Magneto in action. So that's the uh, robot with the electromagnetic 
feet uh, not only can it go inverted uh, it can also uh, do very precise foot placement to walk on narrow beams as and and such and then you see bruce walking on moderately unstructured terrain so it's got uh, 18 cdc elastic actuators we were using uh, Aptronic actuators coming out of Lewis Synthesis uh, Lab at UT Austin, where they uh, spun out a company called Aptronic. So we've been working with them to get the actuators, and we designed and built these robots. So the, the key point is every every robot that you see here uh, have been designed and built by us in the lab. Um, so we do have a bunch of papers. Um, describing various bits and pieces that we've done. We've done work on uh, terrain classification using legged robots. We've, uh, we've done um, some whole body control and motion planning. Uh, we've done mechanisms design work. Um, and uh, one of the more recent outputs is we, um, uh, we open sourced uh, one of our quasi static legged robot controllers called OpenSHC, so it's available on GitHub. This is something that we released last year, which is based on close to 10 years work that we've done, done with our legged robots. And uh, I might skip this video and try to go to the next one. So this, this, is, the, this is the one that I talked about earlier. Um, we call it legipulation, so legged manipulation. Nick, Nick was a fan of that word, so uh, I blame Nick for that. Uh, so here you'd see the robot um, sees an obstacle, decides uh, what's the best place to push it, uh, and then then goes on and does that. And uh, it also takes into consideration if it's too heavy to push aside, it can be detected by monitoring the, the loads at each of the joints, and then it'll... Uh, uh, it won't keep doing that, so it'll it'll abort. You might see see an example of that later on. And all of this was actually supported with our open sourced um, OpenSHC framework. Yeah, so this is the example where where the object is is heavy. So you'll see it um, aborting the move when the uh, joint loads go beyond a certain threshold. And uh, something that we haven't implemented yet is to use two legs to uh, lift up an ob uh, object. We've done it in simulation, of course, working in simulation <laughs> means nothing when it comes to implementing on the real robot, but that's something that we, we potentially do in the future. Uh, quickly going to the next bit. So we've started using commercially off the shelf available legged robots and they happen to be um, something that you would be very familiar with uh, from uh, from Ghost Robotics. Uh, we, we bought their robots and we put a whole lot of uh, stuff on top of it. And we uh, we make them do very hard things once we get them. So you'll hopefully see in this video. So I apologize for the quality of these videos. They're the handheld mobile phone videos, but uh, you'll see what I mean. Uh, so, and what we found out is there's still still a bit of work to be done. Uh, and uh, so we are we are working with uh, with Avik uh, to try and come up with some solutions to give capabilities to these robots to deal with some of these uh, difficult situations that we put these robots in. Uh, so that's that's about it. Uh, I'm yeah, happy to answer any any specific questions you have about uh, the, the, the parts that I showed. Thank you, Navinda. Thank you, Nick, for very exciting talks. Um, yeah, we have a few minutes for uh, for questions. I think uh, 
Uh, I have some, but I think I uh, let, let's let some of the younger people uh, have a go. Thanks, CJ. <laughs> Dan, why don't you start and then maybe people yeah. will. All right. So, so I'm very curious to know how you guys think about the trade offs between where you would use uh, legs, whether they're the commercial legs or your own homebrew. Wh when are you guys inclined to deploy legs and when are you inclined to use those very, very hardened, you know, those tracked vehicles, which are now, I, what, almost. 25, maybe some of them even 30 years old, uh, but but they, they, they're getting a tremendous amount of use. What Do you have any rules of thumb or do you have any emerging ideas about how to make these decisions more um, rationally than intuitively? It, it's a tough one. It's a, it's a very frustrating one for, for me as well. You know, whenever we write papers, pretty much the first few lines of like a robot papers are uh, um, saying how how great legged robots are and how how much of an advantage they have over wheeled and track robots in in, in difficult terrain. Uh, I still believe that is the case. However, I think in in terms of uh, hardware robustness and control robustness, I think we we still have a fair way to go because the reality is most of the environments that we tested our legged robots in, uh, those track robots that you saw the big titans, can can go through them. Uh, one advantage the legged robots have, especially hexapods, is their ability to uh, change their morphology because they, they can uh, be narrow or wider. And that's something that traditional robots cannot do. I think that that is a unique advantage legged robots have. May, maybe not necessarily the, the traditional quadruped um, form factor, but with, with, with hexapods, you can have a fairly small body footprint, but have the, have the legs splayed out. Uh, to gain stability, but if you want to go through a narrow passage or something like that, you can uh, narrow down. So to me, that that's one of the obvious advantages. But in terms of rafter and traversability, right now, as of now, I think the track robots still have an advantage. Nick, Nick, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I was I was going to say that um, I don't think we obviously have a an answer or even a unified opinion on the team or per person. Um, and I think that just sort of goes to show how, like, there's so many trade-offs, right? Like, the tracked robots are obviously really big, um, so they have trouble going through doorways. Uh, they're actually really the big ones, right? Obviously, like, stability is just proportional to footprint size. So, um, you know, to get a stable track platform, it has to be quite large. Um, and... But those large Titan robots are a good compromise for doors uh, and human environments, except we couldn't go up stairwells in the ch challenge with them because the stairwell was too narrow, right? So we did all this work with staircases, stairs, and then we couldn't go up staircases with them, right? And clearly the quadrupeds, the dog-sized quadrupeds are a wonderful balance of the ability to do that, right? Their, their footprint is just that much smaller that they can accommodate those kinds of situations. And, but I think internally, I, you know, Navinda's convinced me of the utility of hexapods, right? Where you have this incredibly large polygon of support in an alternating tripod gate. I mean, I know you guys uh, looked at that with um, uh, our hex and stuff like that, but it's sort of like, there's something there, I think. And, and then the question I think isn't, is it useful? It's where is it useful is what you're asking, right? And I'm becoming a little more convinced with hexapods being on the scale that Navinda has in the background, which are smaller smaller platforms like in your roof um, in very aggressive terrain because the robot's small, right? Where you're not going to put a quadruped up in your roof to do inspection, I think you might a hexapod, if that makes sense. I can't tell if you guys can hear me, but I'll assume you can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we yeah. can hear you loud and clear, Nick. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm paranoid after losing it last time. So. <laughs> no, the, the universe just didn't want to talk about affordances. That's all. No. 
but yeah, I think we'll like I I think we'll do legged work. I don't want to say in perpetuity, but I think whether it's working with off the shelf platforms or developing custom ones, I think will depend also on the size of the project, right? Like we were so determined to make the hexapod work for DARPA and it really just became a budgetary issue of, um, you know, supporting it and, and competing with, you know, competing with ghost, right? Like it's very hard to do that. In your work, have you found settings where the kind of agility that you would only get with legs, you know, the ability to leap or the ability to potentially swing, um, you know, are, are there settings where, where you, you know, it's clear that the limbed machines are, are going to be better, but we just don't have the capability or is that not even yes. so clear? Absolutely. So that's a really good point. And I think that really ties back into the affordances at the start. So the biggest issue we have is step ups, right? So those Titan vehicles, they are probably the most aggressive tracked vehicle you're ever going to get that's going to fit through a door. I mean, that's just what they are, right? They embody that. And they cannot go over a 300 millimeter step up, right? They just flip over backwards, basically. And that's clearly something a legged platform can do, right? Um, even though if you think about the raw angle, like the average angle of attack, um, you know, of the ground, I actually think the track vehicle can do that equally well, if that makes sense. It's got a very low center of mass. It's got a lot of traction. Um, so I think the thinking of affordances of where can this vehicle execute a specific behavior is where the world needs to move to with legged systems. And I think that's what's so exciting about it, right? Um, and then obviously, you know, you can think about that more generically with mud and all these things, but the clear win is things like steers, discrete changes, step heights in terrain um, are just incredibly difficult for wheeled and tracked platforms. And I think even planners for, you know, like you can say, yes, maybe, I can just use a, a planner that's completely generic. Uh, but I also think there's something to be said for, you know, if I want to do an extra 10% or 50% in step height, you're probably going to have to use a more specialized behavior where you're thinking about how you're releasing energy in a different way, maybe, you know what I mean? So I don't know. I really get like, especially after this challenge, I really see that as a, as a thing. Great. We're, we're, this is great. We're running out of time, unfortunately. Let Maybe if there's any one more question, if anybody has a question. Uh, um, I had something. Um, so I guess looking at how it, during the DARPA challenge, you guys kind of had this multi-agent coordination between the track vehicles. When you are thinking of legged like, robots, are you thinking of doing something similar and possibly um, considering like mix using like a quadruped and possibly one of your um, in-house hexapods, I guess, like what are your thoughts? Because I'm trying to like see kind of what you guys are thinking in that frame of mind. And what challenges you think it'll present? Yeah, so from a, uh, for the for the DARPA challenge perspective, purely due to its, um, uh, I guess, hardware maturity and all that, we probably won't uh, be using any of the in-house hexapods in the final event, but we are definitely considering using uh, one of the ghost quadrupeds or, or, or multiple of them. Uh, and the plan is in the in the task allocation, in the multi-agent task allocation, there would be some consideration for agent capability. So it, we won't necessarily be considering all agents to have the same capability. So the agents would be heterogeneous. Uh, the the sensing payload would be homogeneous. So you saw the pack, the the uh, the perception pack that Nick was talking about, the cat pack. That that'll that'll be the same across all platforms. But when the tasks are allocated, there there would be a notion of platform capabilities when the tasks are allocated. Uh, look, uh, if we had time, I would go and start asking you, how, how are you going to do auction? How are you going to have an auction where legs are bidding against drones? That would be fascinating. We'll save that maybe for the next talk that we hope that you guys will give uh, us. It was very, very exciting to see your work. And we're so grateful that you would take the time to, um, you know, come and, and talk to us. Uh, we know that we're going to be uh, 
having you know good connections uh, uh, in the person of uh, Miss. Uh, uh, Abriana Stewart Height, and we we we're I'm sure that we'd like to continue to uh, increase these uh, interactions. Uh, you know, Nick. You know, we'll even talk to you if you go to Amazon too. That's you know that, that's that's part let's, of the yeah. I hope you do. Let's um let's give um, another round of applause for our speakers. Uh, thank you so much, guys, and uh, we'll look forward to you know more communication and and more discussions. Thank you. Thank so you much, very much Dan. for having us. And thanks, Abriana, for, for arranging all of that. It's been great. Thank you, everyone.